Okay, welcome everyone. Thanks for joining us today for this Cultivating Success webinar, talking about encouraging native pollinators with plant diversity. The Cultivating Success program was established in 2000 by University of Idaho Extension, the nonprofit organization Rural Roots and Washington State University Food Systems Program. Just a couple of webinar tips as we get started today. If you are like me and you are sharing bandwidth today, you might wanna close all the other programs that are running on your computer. If at any time you're having issues with sound, you can type into the chat box. Myself and Mackenzie Lawrence will be standing by to help with any technical issues. You can find the chat box in the control bar at the bottom of your screen. If you have any questions for our speaker today, you can type them in during the presentation. We will have time for Q&A. We'd like you to type those into the Q&A box if at all possible. That helps us keep track of the questions and not lose anything in the chat. This webinar is being recorded and a slide handout and the webinar will be available from the Cultivating Success website tomorrow. With that, I'm really excited and honored to introduce today's presenter, Susan Flugel. Susan is with Working Gloves Farm, and she's also a board member for Rural Roots, the organization that I mentioned co-founded Cultivating Success. She's going to be talking to us today about native pollinators and some of the research that she is doing on her farm. So Susan, I'd like to go ahead and hand the screen over to you and welcome. Thanks for joining us. Thank you for having me. Great, we see your um, slides. My, you see my slides, great. <laughs> That's always good. Um, <laughs> My presentation is on how to can encur encourage and cultivate native pollinators with plant diversity. And the first thing I want to ask when looking at that is, one thing I wanna mention is humans don't necessarily know what pollinators want. And this has been a problem with a lot of the gardens we design, a lot of the even pollinator gardens we assume a lot of times that pollinators want what we want, which is big flashy flowers and bright colors. Well, a lot of what we've found out now is, is that we don't even have, um, pollinators don't even see flowers the way we do for one thing. A lot, they see an ultraviolet, they see a different color range. Uh, many flowers that we think are plain flowers actually have little landing ultraviolet strips on them. They have big bull's eyes on them. They're pretty much pointing like here's our pollen. So until recently, we didn't understand the way they see the world is different than us and that their needs are different than us. So many of the flowers that we have altered and designed for our own pleasure are actually not feeding and maintaining pollinators. And one example of this is a study that was done in 2017 revealed that many plants in garden centers that are labeled bee friendly are actually not attractive to pollinators. They looked at 74 different full bloom plants. So plants full bloom should be attracting many pollinators. And it was across six garden centers. And they compared it to a standard plant that they knew would attract in the pollinators in the same spot, same time. Uh, Merigium, which is an, an herb that's related to oregano and is extremely effective at attracting pollinators. Um, they found that almost all the plants did not attract near the number of plants that merigem does. And some did not even attract any pollinators. They looked really good, but insects wanted nothing to do with them. So the majority of these plants were actually on the bee friendly list. And ironically, they didn't attract pollinators where some plants that were on, not on the bee friendly list did. So you can't really rely on labeling plants bee friendly as to know that it will actually work in your garden or on your farm. What's beautiful, you know, we see these beautiful gardens and we're, I used to assume, and this is for up in Spokane, these pictures. These gardens look gorgeous, but I remember walking around them and seeing hardly any pollinators. You know, I'm sure I saw honeybee here and there and 
Some plants attracted a lot, but many of the plants weren't attracting many pollinators. At the time, I didn't think much about it because this is before I'd done my pollinator study. And with my pollinator study, I had a large square at my mom's farm full of blooming plants that she had selected because she had researched them and she knew that they had the ability to attract pollinators. This square attracted pollinators by the thousands. So it kind of got me back to thinking about the formal gardens I have walked in and thinking, these gardens should be full of pollinators. Why aren't they? And I looked around for studies and sure enough, there were some studies done. Um, same person did the studies in the plant uh, centers. Also looked in urban public gardens and they found out that there were no insects visited 30% of the plants in these public gardens. 77% of the plants were so unattractive that they were very poorly attended or not attended at all. And only 4% only of all these flowers were highly attracted, attractive to pollinators. So to have a garden full of flowers that only 4% are attracting the majority of the pollinators, um, that's, that's actually kind of sad when you think about it because you're losing opportunity to take the time to select better plants could enhance pollinator habitat by 100 fold or more. And there's actually a new field that I just read about, which some people might be interested in, actually merges landscape and pollen ecology. And they're starting to address these questions like how can we make our public areas friendlier to pollinators? So one thing I wanna mention is diversity includes both native and exotic or non-native plants. Pollinators aren't xenophobic. They don't care if the plant they like comes from overseas, they like it anyway. Um, pollinators benefit from having a mix of native and non-native plants. And a lot of times you see people, they might get stuck in one. A lot of times people will have exotic plants in their yard that they got at the garden center, or maybe they're just gonna go full-fledged, full native plants. I've seen that happen too. Research actually shows that if you want to do the best for your pollinators, you carefully select non-native plants to fill in the gaps in the landscaping that can increase your pollinator habitat. So there might be a blooming time around here in the fall, for example, or early spring, or maybe very midsummer, where the native plants aren't blooming due to heat, cold, um, not being ready yet. If you're, you could expand your pollinator population by selecting the plants that will fill in those gaps. And you can actually find some that will pretty much bloom from early, early spring to late, late fall in this area, we'll have a great area for that. So that will help the pollinator populations. And that's one thing you should consider when you're thinking about plant diversity and how to select for pollinators. And I'll talk a little bit more about some plants that will bloom the whole season long. Pollinator visits also increase with more flowers, of course, in a peak blooming season. So if you can be, keep something in your yard at peak blooming season all season long, not only will it look great, or your farm, look great and it will attract insects at the same pollinate at the same time. So ironically, adding a few non-natives actually benefits the whole plant community. So they found that it actually helps, um, oops, sorry about that. It actually helps by um, enhancing the populations of their specialist po pollinators. So oddly enough, specialist pollinators, which you would think would be the ones that would be, find it detrimental to have a non-natives, were increased when other non-native plants were brought into that could supplement their diet. And the communities that had exotic plants had greater total plant and pollinator richness. They also had a higher amount of relative nestedness. Now nestedness is a measure of structure in an ecological system. So you have species-species interactions, you also have species distribution. So the higher the level of nestedness you have, the healthier your community is as a whole. And these non-native plants actually help contribute to the healthiness of the community. Um, there's also been some studies done in California that's showing that having a more diverse native plant community, those communities also contain more non-native species. So the non-native species in this case were not out competing the native species. The diversity was allowing both to flourish. Um, Interesting too, people always assume that pollinators are less effective in urban areas. And so, but if you're in an urban area, actually sometimes pollinators could be more effective, particularly bumblebees. So one study looked at having red clover at test spots. 
and they compared these to um, they put out basically small plots of red clover in urban and rural areas. When comparing, they found that in the urban areas, the red clover actually had better seed set because it was more adequately fertilized, mostly by bumblebees, which like cities. So we need to kind of consider your pollination needs whenever you're designing either in the rural area or in a city or town. Consider like your landscape composition, how heterogeneous it is. The interesting thing is there's not necessarily a a straight line, it's kind of like a curve where too much is bad, too little is bad. You want something kind of in the middle. You want to have diversity in varying plots, but you don't necessarily want to have too much diversity, but you don't want to mull in the culture either. You want like a happy medium. And we'll talk a little later about plants that can kind of help to fill in because of the keystone plants that the pollinators want to have in their little happy medium. Habitat fragmentation. It can also have diverse effects. It can drive generalization of pollinators. Can pollinators want to take advantage of the diverse and it can kind of edge out specialists or it can actually increase populations as a whole. So once again, that's something that a little is good, too much is bad and you want to kind of aim for the middle like a lot of things in life. Um, adding habitat features, small scale. And by this, I mean homeowners putting out water or if you're in your farm, having a little trough that the bees can drink from, adding a little area where they can nest, that really increases pollinator population. And what drives this pollinator richness is a little bit different in rural and urban areas, but late flower richness, which means diversity. This is particularly important if you're in a rural area where you have a monoculture of wheat and canola, you need to add more flower richness. Ironically, flower richness doesn't seem to be a problem in urban areas where you have little spots popping up in different places. Um, the edge density, how much, how much ed how your edges, how they affect your surrounding landscape. In urban areas, the residential cover can make a difference. And in both cases, the diversity of the habitat definitely drives pollinating, pollinator populations up. And I'll say that three times faster. <laughs> so in agriculture too, diversity is gonna drive pollinating. You want to have a diverse group to help pollinate anything if you're planting. Um, they looked at fava bead fields. They found that having a landscape that was diverse, including flowers near the fields, enhanced both bumblebees and honeybee populations. Now, fava beans are self-fertilizing, but they increase the fertilization with pollination, and this indeed happened. And with the natural or semi-natural habitat nearby, they saw populations increase of all the native bees, which was really important over the several years of the study. Um, with high bush blueberry plant plantings, this was a 2014 study. They had a diverse planting of 15 different perennial flowers. They had previously tested these. These were um, native plants that previously tested for the ability to attract bees. So they didn't fall into the trap of just throwing together a bunch of pretty flowers and calling them a pollinator um, seed pack. Now, now these plants that are attracted to bees increase native bee populations and also hoverfly populations. Um, and incre increased it gradually over the four years of the study so that you saw populations just rising over time. And that's what I noticed with my plantings too, is that as the pollinators found the flowers and as the flowers mature, you definitely saw a big rise in populations of all of your native flower flowers. Now, for those of you also concerned with growing food, the fruit set berry weight and the mature seeds in these berries were significantly greater in the fields adjacent to the wildlife plantings. This is one interesting study that just came out um, in 2020 and they're looking at keystone species for butterflies and moths and they found out that 90% of caterpillars food is from only 14% of native plants. 5% of native plant species make up 75% of caterpillars food. So if you're a human that you like butterflies and you love cat, uh, moths and you want to cultivate them, you definitely want to plant them, these particular um, species that will attract their caterpillars. So for the woody host, there's, which are like, of course, trees and bushes, any of the oak variety, willows, cherries, plums, and peaches, um, popular aspen and cottonwoods and pine. And all of these grow great around here, particularly like um, you know, plums and you'd have to be in loose to probably grow the peaches, but you know, oaks grow around here. Willows, of course, love it around here. 
So all of these grow great. And these are important cornerstone species for pollinators. And you can even get smaller varieties of them if you have a small yard. Now for herbaceous plants, you see things like clover and goldenrod, but you blanket flowers, night, and the nightshades, which are tomatoes and peppers. Um, you see strawberries, lettuce, <laughs> buckwheat. Now, one thing I really noticed when I was looking at this is many of the caterpillars' favorite plants are also our favorite plants. And that's one reason we have to fight with them in the garden, because think how much often you have to try to pick off or to discourage caterpillars from eating your lettuce or your strawberries or your tomatoes or your peppers. Um, we probably don't notice them if they're out in your big willow tree, though. You know, they kind of get a free reign on that. But just something interesting to think about that they have a preference. And one reason they have a preference for some of these plants is um, plant phytochemical concentration makes a difference on what caterpillars like to feed on. If it's too high, it will be less nutritious. It'll be an antifeedant for caterpillars. So our food plants, we don't like things that are too high in phytochemicals or antifeedants either. They, it can, they can taste bitter to us and be less nutritious. So we select along the line, some of the same things that caterpillars select for feeding. So when they looked at this, if you just selected 20 plants at random, like if you're wanting to run the garden center and you're like, I want that shrub and that tree and that shrub, um, and just randomly selected them, they found that that kind of thing would support just 38% of butterflies and 13% of the, the plant caterpillar interactions. However, if you were thoughtful about it and just half of the species that you selected out of the 20 were actually species, these keystone species from these lists, you would actually support 71% of butterflies and 40% of the plant caterpillar interactions. This correlation is even greater for the herbaceous plants. Planting 20 plants randomly, which is what many people do, right? You just wander to the garden center or you look at seed catalog and you say, oh, that looks good. Hey, look, it has a beef and leaf thing next to it. And you plant it. Um, these, if you only plant 20% it's kind of randomly selecting, you're only going to support 13% of potential Lepidoptera species, which are butterflies and moths. And 2%, only 2% of the caterpillar plant interactions are supported. Now, if you think about it and plant 10 keystone species, and then maybe 10 you like, that you randomly selected, you're going to support 42% of Lepidoptera and 10% of interaction. You may have also guess from looking at this that woody plants are really important for Lepidoptera. So having a couple of woody plants whether they be small or large ones in your mix can really add to population stability. Now below there, I have a, a link for an interactive website that this is a website from the National Wildlife Foundation. They worked with the people that did the study and they have, they allow you to find what plants are best for butterflies in the area. So it's still in beta testing, but I tried it, it seems to work pretty good. They just don't have all the pictures up yet. So you link onto it, you put your, your um, zip code in and they will tell you what plants from your area have been proven to support butterfly and moth populations and caterpillars. It's pretty fun actually. This one I threw in just because I thought I'd find it interesting. Um, energy efficiency determines flower preference in bees. I'm a person that likes energy so I thought this was kind of an interesting way for bees to and honeybees to decide what flowers they wanted to visit. Um, this is a 2021 study and it found like bee foraging energy efficiency is determined both by the bee body weight and by the weight rate at which they visit flowers. So of course the number of flowers a bee visits a minute determine how much nectar energy she collects. Um, heavier bumblebees and on average bumblebees are twice as heavy as a honeybee and some bumblebees I've seen are more like six times as heavy as a bumblebee. They visit flowers two or three times faster than lighter bumblebees. Um, about half the pollen and nectar energy they gather is also used in foraging. So, of course, also shaping the form of the blooms influences their choice. Um, bumblebees will also switch flowers depending on which species are in full bloom. And really large bumblebees they found can actually decide if they want to remember where a specific flower or patch of flowers is and come back to that because they are able to use more energy to gather their resources because they can carry more. Whereas medium-sized bumblebees, a lot of times will just go with whichever flowers are closer and choose not to remember, because it takes energy apparently for a bee to remember where the flowers are at. So due to the, all these misconceptions, you might've noticed that a lot of the studies I quote are new. People are doing a lot more pollinating studies because they wanna know 
do these trants really attract pollinators? Do they really work? Or are we just relying on a picture of a bee placed on a pot in a nursery? Um, my mom, Jane Flew, and I, we received a WSARE grant. And this was going to research whether plant architecture, which is the shape and form of plants, or plant genetic diversity, enhance pollinator abundance and our diversity. And basically, I was kind of curious if shape and form made more of a difference than plant genetics and pollinator plots, or if they had equal weight or what was going on there. But, but one other main thing, which I'm mostly talking about today, is I wanted to know what kind of plants attracted or combinations of plants attracted pollinators in this area. What kind of pollinator diversity I would see, which plants would attract which different kinds, and also the care and hardiness of the flowers to be recommended for urban or rural, rural areas or urban areas, um, easy care. So I use time lapse cameras. The photo that you see on my screen here is actually how we moved the camera. So here's our time lapse camera here, it's protected by waterproof casing. It has a cute little sunshade over that that was really necessary in the middle of the summer. And it has a, a sturdy, easy um, hollow metal pole that we use with a step in bottom. So you could just step it in and move it. And that's my husband, Chris Bailey, designed these, which I was really grateful for. It took four or five different attempts before we got one that we were really happy with. You can also see here, you can move the camera up and down to get the ideal height so that you can view pollinators. And it worked really great. It was really fun watching all the different pollinator videos. I spent a lot of this winter watching fun videos of pollinators interacting with plants. And it gives you a different perspective on the plant when you can sit there and just watch it. Time lapse does it fast, but I usually slow them down so I can count and observe them. And it's just really fun. Um, and one of the parts of the research, of course, was identifying the plants that I saw and um, counting them plus all of their different families to see who attracted what. Now, these plants that I'm going to be talking about, they're all easy care. Because lucky for you, I didn't select the plants. My mom, who is a total plant specialist and has been plant nursery selected the plants, um, don't get her started on plants that she she sees selling in nurseries here that aren't suitable for this climate and will winter kill because she'll definitely tell you about it. So all the plants, were, they're almost totally gear proof. I only had like one bite out of one plant the whole two years or actually it's been almost three years that we've had them growing on the farm. All are like super pollinators just about. They attract so many pollinators. All but Gallardia are hardy to zone three. And some of the Gallardia did even survive a really bad winter. The Gallardia survived for two years then it kind of winter killed a little bit, but it's also a short-lived preandra, which is not quite as um, sturdy. However, I think it's worthwhile if you have a warmer or nicer area than we did. We have them out in a field where we have seen temperature swings of over 60 degrees in one day, and that is in the summer. It also regularly gets frost in the middle of summer where we live. So if you're in a more sheltered area, these plants would be great. Um, all are fairly drought tolerant after the first year. You do have to water most of everything when you plant the first year just a little bit to get it established. A combination of these plants will attract actually all the different families of native pollinators and also some beneficial insects, which I looked at the same time. And I included some non-native plants that are common and some, but non-invasive, and some nativores, which are cultivores that are derived from a native plant. So not the native plants themselves, but cultivores that have been bred from those plants. And Last but not least, there are other great pollinator plants in the Pacific Northwest. I'm just talking about the ones I personally grew, recorded for two years. They're kind of like my family now because I've interacted with them so long ago. So I recorded them, I know them now, and I can definitely tell you they're different traits. So first, just a quick planting tips on what you wanna do with these plants. You definitely wanna kill perennial weeds before planting. I use billboard tarps, which you can actually buy really cheap because it's cheaper than buying regular tarps, and it added like a colorful mosaic on the field. But if you're not into colorful mosaics, you can definitely use like a plain black tarp or brown tarp, which would kind of blend in. Make sure you cover it with something. You don't have to do this. This, this is solarization, and I actually did research on this before, and it helps by killing the weeds off. Why I use solarization, some people don't like it because it can also affect the microbiota in the soil but it kills your perennial weeds that are really hard to kill. In this case, we have um, Canadian thistles and Scotch thistles 
And this basically got rid of most of them. Um, I didn't want to be fighting the weeds when I had a plot. I didn't want to be weeding all the time. Um, a lot of times one mistake people make when they go organic is you just suddenly decide to go organic and you just plant right in the same place where you've been perhaps spraying weeds before. And a better way to do it is to try to get rid of the weeds first, then go organic. And for a non-toxic method, I can really recommend tarps work really good. I kind of spot do it. I don't do it everywhere, just where I have a big nest or problem with cranial weeds, um, especially something I can name thistle, which is hard to control. If you water first, then you put the tarp over, you get like a good sauna built up there, steam, um, do it during the hot time of year, obviously. Though sometimes during the winter when it's really cold and chilly, you can kind of rot them too. So both of those work. Um, it's much easier to eliminate those weeds first, even if it takes a couple extra you know, months in thinking about it. I really advise you, please, please don't spray pollinator plots because you're trying to um, support the pollinators, not to eliminate pollinators. And more and more research is showing the harm that spraying, especially pesticides, but herbicides can also have effects on pollinator numbers, abundance. And native bees in particular are being affected by spraying so-called safe um, pesticides around or safe insecticides around. They're not really safe. They definitely do affect native bees' abundance. So it's just sort of something to think about. If you design your plot carefully, you won't have the problem with weeds and other insects especially if you design really easy if you use really easy care plant plants that aren't fussy and that are adapted to this region it makes a big difference because you won't have problems with um, aphids and other insects and natural predators will be right there to get on them and the plants are hardy enough that you won't see a decline i would advise to plant patches i like three to seven because i like odd numbers if you're not as anal as me maybe you would like even numbers i know i'm i kind of i just kind of like the way they look I incorporate mixes in. So have a pat, patch of one, then put another one in. If you have two that are equally dominant, you could put them, you know, alternating if you want it to in the patch. That also looks really pretty. I'll show you some pictures of that later. Don't plant a late starting plant like a Gallardia by a cat mint. In fact, don't start anything that starts late by the cat mint. Anything that's weak, that cat mint will take it over so fast. The cat mint's great. I love it a lot, but it is definitely a sturdy plant, great for farms, um, no care required. In fact, I even transplanted three catmint in the middle of the hot summer last year. And I did water them a little when I transplanted, but probably not as much as I should have. And they all regrew in the fall and are looking great now. So catmint's really tough, but it will overtake and shade out the smaller plants because it and the salvia I'm talking about will come up really early in the spring. So kind of take into consideration when your plants emerge for the planting. You, mulching around plants is great. I mulched my project because I needed it to be uniform, but I did leave some bare earth outside of my experimental plots. And this is important because many bees and bumblebees are ground nesters. And so by leaving some bare earth around, um, or you, conversely, you can put compost on it. They will dig down through the compost so it won't look bare but it will still work just as well for bee nesting. And consider drip irrigation. I actually did drip irrigation for my experimental plot because I had over 80 plots. Each plot had six plants in it each. So I did not want to be hand watering them. I just wanted to add a little supplemental water when it needed it. So here's some of our plant recommendations. The first two I really love, um, the salvia, we did Corridana and one called East Friesland and also the catmint. The bottom picture there is of the two growing together. And this is truly a, a gorgeous combination of plants. So catmint's the lighter blossom, the darker blossom is the salvia and it's a Corridana. I like both the salvias, but the Corridana is definitely my favorite. It, it's a, it's a great plant. It looks, you have it outgrowing in a field. I wasn't taking care of these plants or babying them anyway. I was just acting like if I were a farmer and I just threw some plants in and besides filming them, I'm, you know, I'm not going to baby them because they, they needed to see if they would perform. So these plants actually, the little cordonis, they look like they're in a formal garden. No matter what you do, they have, they're neat, they're discreet, they have these, these pretty flowers. Even when the flowers die back in midsummer, you have new ones that come up and replace them for the fall. Um, with both these plants, if you give them a little supplemental water, just a teeny bit right in the middle of summer, it prompts 
a new blooming cycle. And so there's like, really, there's a little dip in the middle of summer with their blooms, but they bloom continually from very, very early spring until the first hard killing frost of winter. I mean, they just bloom the whole, almost the whole year, it seems like until winter. So these plants, the salvia supports bumblebees and solita native solitary bees and also native wasps. So those were the three families that's almost prevalent on those plants. Um, and people really like them too. They attract a lot of attention from the people that came by to check out our pollinator plot. The cat I like because it's just so tough. Um, it is beloved by really big fat bumblebees. Honeybees loved it too. If you have honeybees and want something to give them as a supplement, um, they love the cat mint. When we first started our experiment, the honeybees hadn't found it. Then all of a sudden, three different groups of honeybees show up. I could tell they're from three different hives because we had different colors and types. Honeybees, one was like an Italian, one was a dark, one was a light. So we saw a lot of different honeybees. Once they showed up, they just moved right in on that cat mint. Um, it's also beloved by cats, as you can see from my top picture here. That sadly was a frequent occurrence in the pollinator plot that you'd be walking along right at dusk so you could change where the cameras were. And suddenly your feet would become enmeshed in little paws by some cat that had been waiting, lying in wait for you underneath one of the large cat mints. Um, I believe this particular cat is named Butterscotch. Anyway, the cat mint it is both of these are really great for supporting pollinators all season long so i really recommend if you have a garden that you include one of these or both of these as support plants just have a continuation of blooms throughout the whole year and they are beautiful too now the glory like i talked about you got a protected area you're in the city of moscow you're fine um you're next to a house it's long maybe you're on the edge of a hill you're not right you know, you're a little lower elevation than we were at at my mom's place and it doesn't drop quite so cold. You probably grew up really fine. Like I said, we still have some growing there. It just is not quite as reliable. We did burgundy and it's a, a, also another Navator. It's uh, derived from the blanket flowers, which you can see on a lot of hills. And be really careful when you're looking at this cultivars of Gallardia because there are some that aren't winter hardy at all and some that are. Um, they attract loads of medium bees. Um, you see the hoverflies on there. They also do solitary native bees and butterflies love them too. And they are one of the keystone support plants that I talked about before for supporting caterpillar growth. Um, just be careful when you look at them in the spring, they will look dead and they're not. Don't pull them up, they're not dead. Just a little warning. I mean, they honestly, they look dead in the spring. If you just wait, they will come up right from the roots and from their dead looking stems. So they do regrow um, from the base every year. And it's just really hard to tell, but they're beautiful. They usually have red bloom. So these developed a lot of yellow sports. So I had red and yellow patches all out through, which was great. Um, Shasta Daisy was another one. We did the variety of Alaska. Now these are hybrids. So since they're hybrids, they, they do a couple of things really good. They like to reseed. Um, so do not plant them if you do not want a big patch. And they like to, um, their reseeding, since their hybrids will not look like the original. You will get Shastas of every size, shape and color. And they will, well not color, they'll mostly be white, but they will look different in all different ways. Um, they do look messy at certain times and they can also look gorgeous at certain times. I like them because they support the smaller, less known pop pollinators you know the pollinators that just quietly do their work and don't get any press you know they're not cute like big bumblebees they're not like busy like a honeybee they just sort of do their work quietly um buzzing along and so those little teeny small ones and also all the pollinating flies because shastas have a very distinct odor you either love it or it's neutral to it but or you hate it um i was one of the persons who kind of hated it i have to say even though i thought they were really pretty so definitely kind of take that into account. I would not plant it underneath my window in my kitchen unless you smell it first. Just a warning. Um, there's a reason it attracts flies, but out in the yard, away from where you're sitting or out in a big patch in your farm, they are really great plants for pollinators. Uh, and they bloom in huge waves, which are very striking during the summer, but they're short-lived preannual too, but they will reseed themselves very easily. So that's a warning. Um, the Husker Red, 
This is a, another uh, native or, and it blooms really early in the season before many other flowers, like either late spring, early summer, it blooms. And I put here is great for photographing bee butts, and it is because they're always, always in on that plant. Um, they love it. And it's a gorgeous plant too, it has reddish foliage, very striking white blooms. It's another one that could be in a formal garden. It looks really unusual and interesting. The blossoms turn into a glossy dark seed head, which is also very ornamental. So this plant's pretty much ornamental from the time it pops its little head up until the last frost. Very pretty plant. Um, it attracts lots of bumblebees and solitary bees. So great for attracting bees. Doesn't really seem to attract flies or any of those things at all, mostly bees. Terracotta and Well Velvet were two of the yarrow varieties. And yarrow, yarrow of course, is another native plant that's been um, modified in this case. And yarrow, I would really recommend adding a yarrow because they support all the solitary native bees that support flies. They support so many natural predators, um, particularly uh, spiders, um, damselflies, lace wings. I could see them all hanging out on the yarrow. So they have that flat top that butterflies also sometimes like to sit in, on. And they're basically show-stopping plants too. They're huge. You don't want to put them in front of other plants because they get really large. Masses of either terracotta has mixed colors, yellow, orange, brown, beautiful blossoms. The red velvet is just a bright, bright red. Um, very tough. I don't think, I don't know how you'd kill a yarrow. You'd actually have to try to kill a yarrow. I think they're tough like the cat mix, basically. Um, also, these are really good because they, people worry about yarrow receding, but and I had this huge plot and I only saw one or two yarrow that receded. I mean, hardly any. It's, it's very, um, not very common at all. And it was a terracotta, I believe, that did a little bit. But, you know, when you're just talking a couple little plants, you're, we're not talking like a shaft that can populate like a whole field. Um, Veronica, I, this is a truly outstanding and beautiful plant. This plant, I counted over 250 pollinators in a half an hour of recording on this plant. Um, there's another plant that I didn't mention that too, but this plant was outstanding and it attracts the pollinating wasps like you would not believe. And no, these aren't the ones that sting you. I will say I've been wandering around in the middle of these pl plants with thousands of buzzing pollinators around me. I have never been stung. Um, these wasps were not inclined, and many of them were solitary wasps. So when people think of wasps, we think of like yellow jackets and those sort of things. But these are solitary wasps. They do not uh, want, they don't sting, they don't want to bite, they just want to get some pollen and go home to their kids, you know, like everybody else. Um, so they're covered with busy insects during summer. And when I say covered, I mean, honestly, they are covered, their flower spikes are just, just totally dripping, dripping with insect. It was the most outstanding thing you could see when they're in full bloom. Um, they bloom right during midsummer and they have gorgeous blue spiky blooms, gorgeous green glossy leaves. It's a, it's like the um, salvia I was talking about. It looks like it's maintained. Even if you don't do a thing to it, it looks like it's a formal garden plant. So just beautiful plants. Um, really great for someone who doesn't want a messy pollinator plant but wants to attract bees. And like I said, once again, no care for these things. Um, the Campanial, the super both that we tried. This was kind of an interesting plant my mom threw it in because she found, saw it was really good for attracting big bumblebees. And guess what? It was great for attracting big bumblebees and solitary bees too. Um, kind of unusual bell-shaped blossoms really attract the larger pollinators. If you like buzzy bees, and once again, you can see a bee butt. If you like bee butts, here's another one for you to try. Um, great, attracts tons of pollinators when it's blooming. Um, not much for things like wasps and stuff, but any kind of buzzy bee, bumblebee, honey. Some honey bees too, but mostly the, the bumbles and the solitary bees. So good for native bees. Um, Liatris. Oh, here's another outstanding plant. I was kind of hesitant when I first, my mom suggested Liatris, so I wasn't sure. Um, we hadn't grown it before, but she said, let's try it. And the first thing I noticed when we got it is it has a bulb, which is really weird. I didn't know they had bulbs. So we planted um, both the white and the violet colored 
Lyatris. And once again, this is a native plant that's been developed as a, a native war. Um, it's called Blazing Star. If you ever heard that, you can see them more around. So these, these more cultivated varieties, they grow huge over. So first they're kind of small and cute, then they get huge and they look like Dr. Seuss plants almost. They have a humongous bloom spike going up four feet, probably even taller as they get older, covered in blossoms, bright white, bright violet, um, outstanding looking. Um, an interesting growth structure there. They have spiky leaves. And even after the blossoms fade, it still looks really cool in the field. So this, the plant structure, the plant architecture is really, really unique and really interesting and attracted with a lot of attention in the field. And the more I saw it out there, the more I liked it. So I've become really fond of them and even more fond of them when I saw it, it just attracted the bumblebees and the native bees like crazy. I mean, sometimes I would see like five bees on one stalk, just beautiful on some of the days. So just a gorgeous plant. So echinacea was kind of like, I, there's a lot of echinaceas and they do attract um, mostly fat bumblebees and some solitary bees. They don't attract quite as, ours didn't attract quite as many as some of the other plants and that's because they didn't have quite as many blossoms. They stayed small, you'd have to have a larger plant in echinacea or maybe one of the other echinacea varieties. We tried one called Hot Summer and it was really pretty. It looks almost fake when it's blooming because the, you can't really see from this picture but it has an iridescent flower. But the interesting thing about this echinacea, which my mom told me was common of a lot of echinaceas, is that if they don't like where you plant them and you can't really tell if they're gonna like it or not sometimes, they will just die on you over the winter. You can have them plant like 10 feet from each other and one, they'll like one area and they won't like the other. And it's sort of arbitrary. It's hard for the gardener to tell. Um, sadly, only the plant knows what it likes in this case. You're, you can increase your odds a lot by making sure the roots aren't wet and the soil is well draining. You also need to make sure the crown is not covered and is in drier, drier soil. But um, there's some parts of this that are just a little bit arbitrary. So if you like a challenge, um, they're a gorgeous plant. A lot of the echinacea though, I like, they're really pretty. A lot of the other cone flowers probably would be easy to grow and you'd get the same benefits of attracting. Like I said, mostly the big fat bees though. I did see some smaller native bees that also enjoy these flowers. So I was talking about how you need to make sure you have plants in autumn. And one of these, the selenium is a really good choice for autumn plants. It basically, just like the other plant I was talking about in the autumn, I did count over 250 pollinators in half an hour on this plant also. So they, it was just swarming, you know, you could just see all the, all the different kinds of bees and it's particularly the helicidae, which are those cool metallic, green or green with striped, like the one I see in a picture here. Those families love these in the autumn. They provide a really valuable food source for right when you are, um, everything else is dying down and all the bees converge in those. A lot of those medium sized native bees are trying to get the food for the winter um, to, to stack in with their eggs, you know, so they could or protect themselves. So these are a really good choice and Another thing that I don't mention here, but I would recommend for the for autumn plants that bloom are all the asters. Asters are also really good. We had some out there, they weren't part of my pollinator experiments. They include them, though I took a lot of pictures of them, but they attracted just as many bees as the selenium during the autumn season. They were just covered, particularly with the small native bees. And also some wasps. Um, wasps also like these, mostly the solitary wasps, like the thread waste wasp and the other wasps, like I said, we do see some of the yellow jackets, but a lot of them are the other types of wasps, the ones that you want to encourage. And it's very compact. It looks really neat. It's another one that could be in a formal garden. Um, so is echinacea, by the way. The echinacea also looks very nice and neat. Neither of those are two of them I see it at all. So here's a picture here. Um, I just showed it twice because I like it so much, but anyway, this is basically what my pollinator plot looked like a lot of the year. Some of the years it even had more blooms. You can see all the different plants blooming and looking gorgeous. Uh, I found that catnip with any of the other plants, Shasta, Salvia, um, Gallardia, it greatly increased both pollinator numbers and diversity compared to the catnip alone. So catnip's a great one to add to other plants to help increase this. It kind of bridges the um, air, times when you don't have other plants blooming 
it just adds continuality to the pollinators. Um, I really liked the catmint walker low. That's what you see in these pictures as a, a nice mound. It's a beautiful growing catmint. It looks neat and tidy. That's the one my mom really liked too. She recommended, she said some catmint varieties aren't as bright. And Corridana was definitely my favorite salvia, though East Freeland also did look nice, but Corridana is just such a beautiful plant. It, it looks so sturdy, grows so well here. Both of these are also long-lived perennials. Um, I've never seen the Corridana reseed at all. I have seen one or two catmint seedlings, but not anywhere near what you would expect for having a huge field full of them. So these are good ones for continuality. Now for the spring, if you want a bonus for the bees, put in some flowering bulbs or have some of the flowering trees or shrubs that, especially if they're fruit tree, that would also be for Lepidoptera. So if you put those in, you can kind of add something in the very early spring, you know, crocuses, other things that will pop up and the bees will use that. And add some late spring flowers like the red husker or husker red. That's a really good one because you want some that just kind of blooms in the late spring when a lot of things aren't quite summer flowers aren't blooming yet. So the midsummer flowers, they seem to really supplement like the catmint and salvia because that's when the, the first wave of blooms for these ever blooming plants tends to fade and then they'll rebloom again. But if you have something like Lardia, Shasta, uh, Superbot, there's other plants too that bloom right in the middle of the summer if you know they're good pollinated plants, those are really good choices. The late summer flowers like the Lytris, um, they were great to perk the pollinators because like I said, those were covered that time of year. And one of the most important things for this region is to include those fall plants, um, like the late fall cold resistant flowers, like the helenium or asters. Both of those survived mild and medium frost, no problem. In fact, all the plants on this list, except for the Gallardia survived medium frost. And the Gallardia even did fine with a mild frost. So they're pretty tough plants. Um, we have, like I said, I'm, my mom's farm is in an area where you get mild frost in the middle of summer. And these plants were in the middle of a field with no protection. We also had a weather, uh, a cool little weather machine out there that was collecting all the data for us. So we could see how far down the temperatures. And one time the temperature in the middle of summer dropped down to 28 and then it shot up to like 70 the next day. And these plants were fine. So if you want tough plants, I can tell you this, these are them. Um, just a quick other considerations for pollinator habitat if you're doing this. You wanna add a watering source, which is great for birds. Um, yeah, they saw, by the way, these attract a lot of hummingbirds too, if you're interested in birds. Um, you can see down here too, before I forget that, here's an example of what happens when you mix helenium and catmint together. Um, beautiful, you can get a beautiful mix. Both these plants are pretty sturdy. The linium's tough even though the catmint starts growing, growing first, so it didn't get crowded out. And you saw these gorgeous mixes of color in your garden. Um, so watering source, considering nest, consider making sure there's nesting areas. 70% of native bees nest in the dirt. Um, almost all bumblebees do. So if you use a lot of mulch, it can be hard for them to dig in. So have some areas where they're light in mulch or no mulch or leave some dirt or just put compost instead of mulch because they actually will dig down in that composted area just like, and compost will also stifle weeds just like mulch was. So a little bit of diversity is probably good. Um, some people put planters where they have a little bit of soil for the bees to use. Bees will also carry their soil and use it in their nest other places too. So having a little bare ground for them is important. 30% um, of the bees nest in cavities. So if you have piles of logs and sticks, which is really easy to have on a farm without even trying, I found. Um, we don't have to worry. We already have naturally have piles of logs and sticks <laughs> sitting around. Uh, or if you want to make a rock pile, you have a rock pile. They love to live in those. One really important thing, don't spray pesticides if you can avoid it. I mean, they it's not good for the bees and it's not good for you. Um, I have an organic farm and even before we got certified organic, we always ran it as an organic farm because the we know that spraying is can be poor for the environment in a lot of ways. Um, if you're in an urban area, I encourage you to embrace dandelions, be a rebel, be that person with dandelions in your yard, because dandelions are one of the first sources of food for bees and a very big source, dandelion and clover actually both. Or you could try having those steppable ones would have those cute little plants too. Some of those are actually very attractive to bees. 
our herbs are another thing that can add a lot. We didn't really get into herbs in this time, something I want to study for pollinators, but they're really good at attracting pollinators. Um, actually, properly cared for plants can be less time consuming than grass. And it's kind of ironic, but I had this giant pollinator plot. And really, the time I spent caring for it was fairly minimal, and I kept it weed free and looking nice. Most of it is because it was mulch to begin with, and I killed the weeds first. So that can help a lot. Um, my mom probably spent more time mowing the grass around the pollinator plot than I did doing anything to it. Partially that was by choice because I wanted it to represent a low care area for pollinators. I didn't want to assume that anyone could take a lot of time um, taking care of it. And partially it's because it really didn't need any care once it got going. So it looks like I'm done with my presentation. I'll have some time for questions if anybody has some. We had, a, we had a question that came in, Susan, and by the way, that was a beautiful presentation. I'm really motivated about my garden and how to That's improve great. my pollinator habitat. And I love that this slide deck will be a resource so I can go back and see the pictures of the plants and think about those pairings. So thank you for putting this together. Um, we have a question about attracting those stinging wasps. So will these plants attract the stinging wasps that we see are, you know, like living in the eaves of our house. Oh, yes. Um, yeah, actually a lot of people have questions about that. I should have addressed it. So I only saw stinging wasps on the plants during like the extreme, the extreme time, like right before the hard frost. That's when I saw more of like the yellow jackets and the, the communal is what those are. Those are communal wasp families that live like that. During the middle of the summer, I did not see barely any wasps on any of the plants. Well, I saw wasps, but they weren't the stinging wasps. They're the small native wasps. And the larger, you see like a large black glossy wasp. That's a thread waist native wasp. And you see a red one. There's a striped ones. There's really a lot of cool native wasps that you can see. So if you're worried that planting these plants will attract wasps to your yard, I would say, no, they won't. Okay, thank you. Um, we have a couple of comments. One is that you designed your pollinator garden so well, it's very well composed. Uh, a question you can, about you water can say, sources. Go oh, ahead. about water sources? Oh, for first for the pollinator garden, it's like you, that, that's definitely my mom. She, she is, uh, does landscape design. She uses mostly native plants and she knows her plants very well. And she's also very good at designing with colors and shapes and forms. So. She selected all the plants and thought about it. So I can definitely pass that compliment on to her. Um, and what was the question that, about water sources? Um, so for bees, do you mean a small source like a bird bath or something else smaller? Like what bird size bath. are we um, As long as it has a slope. So what's important is you want something that the bees can land on and then drink out of. So you don't want to have like just a bucket or they'll drown. So this is really important, have a slopey, a slopey thing. They're usually smart enough, you know, they're not gonna try to jump right in the middle of it and drown arbitrarily. But if you have a bucket and they're thirsty, they will go in there and you can kill a lot of bees that way. So try for um, sort of like a, you know, basin shaped is what I would recommend. Bath okay. or that sort. Okay, great, thank you. Another question, is it better to have flowering plants all together in one place, say a 20 by 20 garden, or have multiple locations, like multiple four by four boxes spread around your property? Depends on how big your property are and what your goal is. Um, that giant patch of flowers was like a mecca for bees. So if you're kind of like me and you're thinking, you know, it'd be really cool to have thousands of buzzing bees in one area. I can really recommend this concentrated plot because I would just walk into, I had people who would, could they just walk in the middle and they just like, it's so relaxing because you're surrounded by flowers and you hear this gentle buzz the whole time, like just the whole time you're out there. And something about that experience, it's just different than having um, a solitary bee patch here or there. However, uh, there's definitely, the bees will, flit around to the different areas. So if you're interested in just putting a patch here, a patch there, a patch there, that will also work well. I would kind of try to make them a little bit larger though, 
So it's worthwhile for the bees to go to them. Because remember what I said about the energy efficiency of bees. If a bee has to fly, you know, all the way across the yard to get from one plant and then fly back and then fly, it, you might as well give them something worthwhile to land on. So try to have a, a you know, at least a medium sized patch, you know, of plants, like 10 plants or 15 plants together or something. Don't just have like one solitary plant, unless it's like a giant flowering tree, you know, then you can do. <laughs> okay, thank you. Um, another question about water. So this is asking, um, Terry's asking, will a canal ditch and livestock water areas provide adequate water? Probably. The bees will definitely go to the wild, wild uh, wildlife or the you know, livestock watering areas. Uh, my mom has a stock tank for her cows and we definitely see them drinking from that. It's just a little harder for them to drink from that. Um, a lot of times you might wanna do what you do with with uh, livestock tanks, if you put something in there that floats, they'll land on that and then drink. You know, something that won't disturb your livestock, but it will, that also helps by the way with birds and stuff too. It prevents, can prevent them from falling in and drowning as well if they have something to land on in the tank. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. So mm -hmm. another um, question or comment, in our pasture, we had milkweed. We tried to pull it all out because it killed, it was killing bees. Is that something that you've heard? Milkweed mm -hmm. is toxic to bees. Milkweed is, can be toxic. Um, that's one reason the caterpillars that feed on it are because they have developed a resistant to that toxin. I hadn't heard about its ability um, to kill bees. I'm wondering if maybe if it was the only source of flowering plant at that time, that bees were actually getting, just getting too much toxin from it. You know, so if it was the only plant there and they were feeding exclusively on it or getting the majority of the pollen or of the nectar from that plant, because certainly it has toxins in it and it could probably have a, a direct, that's why most things don't eat it. You know, it actually has an, kind of an insecticide in it. So I, I could see it <laughs> happening. Okay, thank you. So Jennifer says they are creating a flower garden for bees. They're also wanting to get a hive or two as well. Will that affect their other pollinators? They can compete. So honeybees do compete with native pollinators. So what you need to do in this situation is just make sure you have enough for everybody is what I would recommend. So my, my thing is, you know, like I told you, I could see when the honeybees moved in to my area, but luckily had enough niches and enough plants um, another thing you can do if you're worried about competition is make sure that there are some plants that specifically mostly attract the native and the bumblebees. So like I was mentioning here, which these attract, that's by numbers that I was counting. So I counted out the, put them in different families and I look, I'm like, okay, this plant attracted mostly bumblebees, hardly any honeybees, mostly native bees. You know, I saw, you could see that on a lot of different plants. Then there's some plants that attracted both of them. And so, uh, abundance, having a lot of flowers available, all season long. The all season long helps a lot with the native, plant, the native pollinators too. And also thinking about what plants can I plant that will mostly be used by these native pollinators and not by the honeybees. Cause honeybees are pretty resourceful. So you're not gonna starve out your honeybees. They'll go over a place and get it. But you, then you also be, you know, it's like you, you kind of weigh both of their needs together. Okay. Great, thanks. Kind of a follow-up comment about the wilt, the milkweed is they did have a big garden, but the they saw that the bees were actually getting stuck in, stuck in the plants and dying. So that was- Oh, really? So that's what was happening yeah. with the milkweed. It was getting stuck on a sap. Yeah, they, they are sappy. Yeah. And, and you're right that if you have a plant that has a lot of sap, I hadn't heard about that before, but now I'm gonna definitely research bees getting, getting stuck in the milkweed because that's kind of interesting. Yeah. A few more questions. Um, do pollinators remember where flowering plants are year to year? Yes. So to give an example of with my plot, obviously this apparently was an extreme floral resource in the area because my mom's farm is surrounded by canola and wheat fields. So the canola does bloom once in a while, but she, she doesn't have a lot of flowering gardens around. So the first year, the bees kind of start trickling. First, native bees and honeybees discover it, then bumblebees by the score. Second year, we did not have to wait for them to trickle in. As soon as they started blooming, 
the bees were right there. The honeybees remembered, the bumblebees were just right there. So obviously they are either the queen bee is remembering year to year, um, is what I guess. And particularly in the case of the honeybees, they're definitely remembering year to year because we're not even sure where the honeybees come from. There are no hives within like a mile. And then someone said, well, someone has a hive a mile and a half over the hill. So they're so far away that they wouldn't find it by accidentally stumbling on again until later in the season. So they remembered it from the year before. And so you see a buildup and the bees will keep coming back and every year you will be treated to not only more, a higher population, but you'll be treated to more um, specialists and different bees. So the second year I saw even more unique pollinators, particularly some of the unique pollinating wasps, the unique native bees that I hadn't seen the first year. It's like by having this resource, you can really encourage diversity and can help pollinators to flourish in like a, a, a big community. I'm keeping my pollinator plot, by the way, so I'm probably gonna be testing out more stuff in it, but I'm not, <laughs> I love it too much. I'm definitely not giving up just because this part of the research is done. <laughs> <laughs> so do you know anything about keeping wasps that prey on flies healthy? I pay to add them to our um, pastures, keep the flies down in the manure wondering what I can do to help them thrive here. Um, floral resources will help most most people, you know, those community wasps like the yellow jacks, they get a bad rep a lot of times, but for most of the year, they are happily using pollen as their food source. It's just later when they have big broods, they start going after meat and getting aggressive and they get hungry in the last part of the year, which is another reason they get aggressive towards the fall. But if you, um, I've noticed that if you, Flowering plants, uh, geez, raspberries, you wanna plant raspberries for your wasps, those late blooming raspberries they really love. Um, those sort of things will really help increase your native wasp populations. And depending on the type of wasp, a lot of times the, the you know, a lot of them will eat both meat and nectar depending on, and pollen, depending on what time of year it is. So it just really depends on what type. Some of the adults only eat nectar and pollen and their babies are the parasites on uh, flies and other unwanted insects. So if you keep flies for the adults on hand, you're gonna be able to keep them uh, more and more offspring basically. Great, thank you. And okay. water sources are really important too for wasps. Okay. Great. I kind of think it's funny you got one person wanting to get rid of the wasp, another person wants to cultivate wasps. <laughs> Different kinds though. I really encourage you, don't be scared of the nice native wasps. <laughs> okay, great. Another question, is it correct to assume that living very near an alfalfa, wheat, or sugar beet field will negate the concern about having enough for all the bee types? Well, alfalfa is, is a better source than, than some other, other um, cause it doesn't bloom, but it doesn't bloom all year round. Usually with most crops, they have found out even with these types of crops, if they, if they look at their bloom times, they still need, they still don't cover the whole season, you know? And also a lot of times your native bees might not be specialized to use those particular crops. So bees use flowers in different ways. Some actually bite to get the pollen, some go in, some have a tongue in. Different floral um, inflorescences are different structures will attract different groups of native bees. So you really need that diversity if you want to build a really healthy community. Because whenever you have a monoculture or even two or three main crops, you're going to attract ones that specialize in that crop plus some generalists that can specialize in other. And even the generalists don't always do well all the different crops that just can survive on them. So no matter what is surrounding you, it's probably a good idea to try to, you know, go for the full spectrum of different plants throughout year and they look great yeah, I would green. agree yeah and also depending on the production system there could be pesticides applied to those crops exactly which then could be harmful to the pollinators um like okay. canola for example is often sprayed when it flowers which they're not supposed to do and they do anyway okay our final question susan the slide that talked about some of the veggies that pollinators like was interesting. I'm assuming you need to let some like lettuce go to flower. Um, 
Well, what with the vegetables, what they're talking about is caterpillars feeding on it. Oh, okay. So the butterflies were kind of a unique case. These keystone species were not necessarily just for providing nectar or pollen, they were providing food for their offspring. So many of those plants are ones that caterpillars love to munch on. And if anyone who's tried to grow tomatoes can attest, <laughs> caterpillars love to munch on tomatoes and they love to munch on lettuce. And so you don't have to let them go to seed you might just plant them in a, a part of your garden where you don't mind if that those particular plants get ugly and call that, you know, your butterfly feeding garden or something for butterfly baby garden. <laughs> and obviously they're not gonna look pretty. Um, not like when you have a, uh, a gorgeous um, plot full of flowers, but you'll be providing a very valuable service nevertheless for, and you will be rewarded in getting more butterflies. Thank you. Sorry, my slides were jumping around a little bit when you were answering that last question. Oh, no, that's okay. For this um, presentation, just a reminder to everyone that Susan's slides will be a handout that will be available tomorrow. We would appreciate your feedback on this webinar, telling us how you like the webinar, but also are there other things that you want to know about pollinators? And then to let you know that you can access this webinar and our other recorded webinars from the Cultivating Success website, and we're providing you with that link below. Again, this information will come to you tomorrow in a follow-up email. So the theme of this month is all things insect. So we're looking at pest management and pollinators. Next week, we're gonna be talking about wireworms and Diane Green from Green Tree Naturals and Standpoint is gonna be talking about some very interesting research on her farm and how she obtained a wireworm infestation that was quite grand from her no-till system. And so mm. if you're interested in no-till and pest management, please tune in next week. Then we're going to be talking on the 23rd about orchard pest management in organic systems and then following up with a very important webinar about white rot in garlic, which is a problem in some parts of our state. So we hope that you can join us for one of these other webinars, that you'll complete our evaluation and let us know what you thought of this webinar, what else you want to know about pollinators. And thank you so much, Susan, for presenting today, for doing this research. And I'm really interested to see your final report for this project when it's posted through Western SARE. So thanks again. It's been really interesting, but yeah, thanks for having me. I enjoy talking about it. Great. <laughs> it, it was a really wonderful <laughs> webinar. Thank you. And thanks to your mom. <laughs> yeah, I will pass on her comp the compliments to her design. She's very good at that. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Okay, thank you everyone. Have a great day.